if you're new here, welcome, right? I'm glad to have you here. My name is Nick Lees. I serve as a senior pastor, and I have the privilege of studying God's Word with you, with you now. So um, let's go ahead and get ready to do that. Uh, if you're new, this is our third week in our series, God's Good Design, talking about biblical roles. And a few weeks ago, I explained, hey, this, this series is going to be a little different than how we normally study uh, the scriptures on a Sunday morning. Typically, right, we do verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Um, in this particular series, we're studying themes that are taught within scripture. So over the last two weeks, we've studied God's good design for men, as well as God's plan for men. And today, we're moving into uh, the focus on ladies now. So we're going to be talking about uh, today God's good design for women, as revealed in the book of Genesis. And then next week, we'll go wider again and look at God's plan for women and how he's called them to relate to him and to others and the variety of roles that, that you may inhabit as a woman. And if you're, if you're paying attention, you're like, wait a minute, that sounds very similar to what we did with the men. And yes, that's very true. That was intentional, right? We want to evaluate God's consistency in his design, um, or be consistent, rather, as we evaluate his design for men and for women. And we're going to see that there are a lot of areas where there's overlap um, in how he created us, and yet there are also these beautiful distinctions that we must celebrate and learn to embrace. So go ahead and uh, come forward, ushers, with the Bibles. And if you have a Bible, um, turn to Genesis 1. If you need a Bible, throw your hand in the air. Mark has Bibles for you this morning. And that's typically going to be page number one of your Bible. Genesis 1 is page one. And if you were here two weeks ago, you might remember I shared the preamble to the Nashville Statement. I'm not going to read that again today, but what it highlighted for us is the incredible move that our culture has made away from the beauty of God's good design for human life. And we've seen it, right? Many today in our day and age would deny that God created human beings in his image and for his glory. And included in that abandonment of biblical ideals is God's good design for us as men and women, as male and female. What we see in our day and age is that identity and gender are now viewed as fluid, and linked to our preferences rather than to God's good design and to our biology. And frankly, the cost of this redefinition has been incredibly high. Rather than experiencing God's good design for his creation, we have chosen a a variety of short-sighted alternatives that eventually ruin human life and dishonor God. And there were a few questions that the preamble of the national statement asked us, and I want to repeat them today uh, just for our sake of remembering them. They asked, will the church of the Lord Jesus Christ lose her biblical conviction, clarity, and courage, and blend into the spirit of the age? Or will she hold fast to the word of life, draw courage from Jesus, and unashamedly proclaim his way as the way of life? Will she maintain her clear countercultural witness to a world that seems bent on ruin? And our answer has to be a a resounding, yes, we want to hold on to the the conviction of the Bible and the clarity and the courage of of what the Word teaches. We want to hold fast to Jesus. We want to draw courage for Him. We want to be unashamed in our proclamation of what He says is true. Lord, help us, right? Help us to be this kind of people. And so part of our answer to this is this very sermon series, walking through God's Word. What does He say about His design? important for us to know why did God make us why are we here why did he make us the way that he made us if we're going to joyfully adopt the roles that he's given us and our callings here in creation we believe that God's word is truth and that it must guide every step of our lives and that includes the beautiful creation account that we're about to read here in Genesis especially our design as male and female God is our creator He's the one who's told us how we ought to live, and we agree with him. We agree with him, and we agree with the authors of the national statement as well when they said this, we believe that God's design for his creation and his way of salvation serve to bring him the greatest glory and bring us the greatest good. God's good plan provides us with the greatest freedom. Jesus said that that he came that we might have life and have it in overflowing measure. He is for us and not against us. Now, when we started this series two weeks ago, 
I, I told you I was putting my cards on the table, putting our, our church's cards on the table, so to speak, and we're not wanting to keep anything hidden about where we stand on these issues. So I want to revisit that again for anyone who might be new today who wasn't here two weeks ago. Here at Harvest Bible Chapel, we believe that there are only two genders, male and female, as designed by God and revealed in his word. And as we dive back into our discussion on God's good design here in the biblical roles, um, you need to understand that within Christianity, there are generally two broad approaches to these issues. And I'm going to redefine them for us again. The approaches are, are known as complementarian and egalitarian. Complementarian and egalitarian. The complementarian position believes that God created men and women as equal yet distinct image bearers of God. Equal yet distinct image bearers of God, which means that men and women have equal value, worth, and dignity. And in God's sight, one is not inherently better than the other. However, there are distinctions and complementary roles for each one. So complementarians believe that the gender roles found in the Bible are purposeful and meaningful distinctions. That when we apply them appropriately in the home and in our church, promote the spiritual health of both men and women. Embracing this divinely ordained roles of men and women then further furthers the ministry of God and, and his people and allows men and women to reach their God-given potential. So that's the position of complementarians. The egalitarian position believes that God created men and women as equal without gender distinctions. Equal without gender distinctions. So that means there's no distinction between men and women in equality or in role or function, how they, how they live out their, their, their design. This position asserts that the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3 is the introduction of disorder and hierarchy into our relationships as men and women that that wasn't present prior to the fall, and that Christ's coming actually removes those distinctions. Now, the reason why I'm spending time on this, again, is because you have to understand wherever you land on these issues, whichever one of these positions you adopt will inevitably influence the way that you read the scriptures, the way that you interpret your place in society and in the church and in your marriage and in your home. Like, it has profound implications for all of us. And our church believes and teaches the complementarian position. We believe that it is the most faithful interpretation of the scriptures that reveals a beautiful plan of God for men and women and how they relate to one another. Complementarianism seeks to preserve the biblical differences between men and women's roles while valuing the quality and importance of both genders. And the result of, of true complementarianism is honor to Christ, harmony in the church, and in the home. It's a beautiful thing when it's done well. So there we go. There's the, there's the kind of laying the framework and the ground again for our sermon today. Now let's dig into God's word in Genesis 1. And if you're not familiar with Genesis 1, it is the account of the creation where God makes the whole, whole universe. And the way that he does it is by speaking it into existence. And it's a beautiful thing. There's six days of creation and there's one day of rest. And what we're going to do is we're going to jump in on day six again which is when God specifically makes humans. He makes humans male and female. And so as I read, we're going to start in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31. We'll read to the end of the chapter there. I want you to listen and pay attention for truths about God's good design for women. Okay? Here we go. Here's what God's word says. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. 
and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So these first two chapters here in Genesis reveal the, the beauty of God's design. And frankly, not just for humanity, but for all of creation. That God spoke a beautiful universe into existence. In fact, there are many things to be amazed by. I don't know what you get amazed by, but I personally like going to the zoo and seeing uh, the, the red pandas and, and the monkeys and the seals. And I just love the diversity of, of the animal kingdom that God has made. Uh, maybe for you it's going out into uh, a botanical garden and seeing the, 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 just the beauty of the colors of the flowers and the trees. Um, there's just so many things in, in creation to be excited about and rejoicing in. And so that's what makes it especially interesting when we see that for many uh, Christians even, they, they act like the creation of, of men and women was kind of a divine afterthought. That, that God's design of the, the biblical roles was kind of a, oh wait, uh, oops, I better get this in here. Which, of course, it's not. Right? The role of men and women are woven into God's creation plan. And so our aim this morning is embracing the truth of God's good design for women. Embracing the truth of God's good design for women. And, and we've said this week after week here. It's not about intellectual knowledge. It's not about gaining some facts today. It's about being able to say with God, this is very good. That I agree, Lord, the way you've designed things is, is good, and I want to embrace that. So let's think about this. What elements of God's good design for women do we see here in Genesis 1? Well, we're going to start with God created woman in his image and likeness. God created woman in his image and likeness. Right, verse 27 tells us that God is the creator of woman. Right? He made her, just like he made man. So woman does not come from an ape. She has been designed by her perfect, holy creator. And let's listen to how he made her. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 2 now, and we're going to read verses 18 through 22. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. We hear that there's no helper fit for him. Right? The first man is, is alone. He's, he's lonely. The narrator of Genesis is giving you an opportunity to be dismayed. Like, where is Adam's helper? Where, where's his companion? Where's his life partner? What will God do about this? But he has a beautiful plan. Right? He performs a divine rib removal. The Garden of Eden becomes the first operating room in history. And God is the divine surgeon. And from that rib, he does what no one else could do. He makes woman out of it. But there's a very real sense of closeness here in the way that woman has been made from man. Just by the way that she's made, they are already deeply connected. We also see that there's incredible value placed upon the woman in just the way that God is intimately involved in her creation. Well, not only did God create woman, but as we heard, God created woman in his image and likeness. Verses 26 and 27 of chapter 1 tell us that, that woman was made in God's image and likeness, which means women have the privilege of being the visible representatives of the invisible God. That's a high and a holy calling, ladies. You have the privilege of being the visible representatives of the invisible God. And we see that there's no other part of creation that's quite like humans. We, as men and women, have been set apart by God to represent him to a watching world. This tells us that there are things about woman that reflect the beauty of her creator. Woman's ability to speak and reason and rule over creation and have character qualities that demonstrate God all are part of what it means for a woman to be in the image and likeness of her creator. 
woman as a complete being, both body and soul, is set above all the rest of creation. Now we also read in these verses that male and female, he created them. We've already discussed this in previous weeks, but God created gender. And he made two genders, male and female. And both are equal image bearers of God. We read in verse 28 that God blessed them and part of his command to them was to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth, which is known as the creation mandate. God's desire here is that humanity would populate the earth with all sorts of other image bearers of God. Everywhere that humans spread, there would be reminders of the God who made them, the God who rules over all and who's worthy of their worship. And in light of our recent SCOTUS ruling overturning Roe v. Wade, it's important to remember that these passages form for us the basis of the value of human life. Right? All men and all women are made in the image of God and therefore have inherent dignity and value. From the earliest moments of confe- conception to the very end of life, human life has dignity and value and it's worth protecting. And as Christians... Our calling is to treat all of our fellow image bearers with dignity, even if they hate you and they hate the God that you believe in. That's our calling. And if you're already like, ah, this is a little uncomfortable, I don't like this. That's probably illustrative of of how much the culture has influenced us as Christians in, in the church. What we're laying out here are foundational teachings from God's word from the very first pages of God's word. And frankly, these matters ought to be incredibly clear for us, and we must not compromise them. So let's go back to Genesis now. Let's look at a being who was created in God's image, right? Woman is a being created in God's image. We also see the scripture tells us that God gave woman particular callings. God gave woman particular callings, things that that she is to do while on earth. And one of the primary callings is to have dominion or to rule over the earth. And again, we see that in chapter 1, verses 26 and 28. One of the ways that woman is an image bearer of God is she has authority over the creation. God has delegated authority to women to rule over the earth. So woman is expected to cultivate and care for the world that God has given her. And as we said with the men, that's not a license for us to, to exploit this world We weren't created to drive this world into the ground, but rather to bring forth a bountiful harvest from it. Woman is a thinking and creative being meant to innovate, meant to develop the earth. And as you do that, ladies, you you glorify the Lord. You're fulfilling the reason, part of the reason for which you've been made. He's made you to fill the earth and subdue it, right, to go and explore and unlock the possibilities of his creation, and then to, to make beautiful things out of it, beautiful societies, beautiful inventions, just all sorts of beauty all over the place. So whether you're a farmer or an engineer, a teacher or a tradesman, an artist or an inventor, a homemaker or a mother, you've been tasked with uh, taking what God has given you and doing something amazing, something creative with it. Ladies, it's good for you to exercise the skills and the abilities that God has entrusted to you for his glory. So raise up a crop. Teach the next generation. Build amazing architecture. Cultivate a hospitable home. Nurture a healthy family. But by all means, do not be lazy. And do not be a freeloader. Right? You were made to help subdue the earth. And frankly, nothing about that task is easy. It requires intense effort for an extended period of time. And I'll just remind you that all that God calls you to, he equips you for. So I want to encourage you, ladies, to rise up and subdue the earth, just as God created you to do. Well, another calling of God for woman is to help fill the earth. Again, we see that in Genesis 1.28. Just as the man could not subdue the earth on his own, he cannot fill the earth on his own either. 
they need one another in order to be fruitful and to multiply. This is a work that can only be done together. Right? There's a beauty in the way God has designed things about how man and woman need one another. But what we see, again, in our day and age is that God's good design in this area has been under attack for quite some time. We see a battle raging in our day and age where uh, women fight for their supposed right to fill the earth only when they desire to do so. What started in early feminism as an argument to have control over childbearing has extended into a push for birth control and easy access to abortion. And under the guise of sexual freedom, we now see the demand for birth control and abortion as basic human rights. And yet, that's a rebellion against the very calling of God for woman to be fruitful and multiply. See, God's good design is for woman to have babies. That's very clear from the first pages of Scripture. It's also hardwired into the biology of a woman. And despite our, our culture's false narrative about birthing people, right, the entire world knows that only a woman can gestate a baby, give birth to a baby, nurse a baby. No matter how hard you try, you cannot have a biological male do any of that. And God has even built in a monthly reminder as part of this design for women. Now, I know that this is a sensitive topic, ladies. And unfortunately, sin has broken much in our world. That there are women possibly here today who desire to have children and you have not had that desire fulfilled. There are women who have gotten pregnant and never been able to hold a healthy baby in their arms nine months later. There are women who have faced incredibly difficult decisions regarding the continuation of a pregnancy that may either cost them or their baby or both of them their lives. And I'm sure there are many other scenarios that I'm failing to mention. Here's my point. We must grieve with these ladies and their families. This brokenness is a result of the fall. Sin's curse extends far and wide, including the breakdown of our own bodies against our will. And ladies, if you're here and this is your situation, I want you to know that our pastor team is, is here for you. Your small group leader is here for you. We have a biblical counseling ministry that is here for you. And out in the resource center, if you don't know this, there are, there are, there are resources in our library about miscarriage and infertility. We don't want you to go through these trials alone, as so many women do. They are often the unspoken sufferers in our midst and in our churches. So if that's you, please let us walk with you in this season of life. God does have hope and comfort to offer you in a time of need. Now, underlying these callings that we've discussed so far is God's word in, in the teaching of Genesis 2.18. If you look again at Genesis 2.18, it said, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. What we read there, unapologetically, is that God created woman to be a helper fit for man. And for some of you, uh, that's going to provoke an immediate reaction. Our culture would tell you, get out the axe and start grinding it, and off with my head. Please restrain yourselves, okay? <laughs> Feminists hate this word, this concept that we've just unpacked from Genesis 2.18. They believe that the term helper is demeaning and somehow makes a statement that women are somehow inferior to man. It doesn't imply either of those things. Please realize that there's, a, there's something large at stake here over this battle over the term Helper. Either we agree with God's good design as revealed in his word or we rebel against it. Right? This is not a small thing. This is not an insignificant detail. Do we agree with God or not? And there are some very important observations about this role of a helper that I want to walk us through. First, as God states here in verse 18, the situation without woman was not good. It was not good. God realized that woman was a necessary and valuable part of his creation. She is a helper fit for or corresponding to man. 
And that's really the complementarian view in a nutshell, that, that man needs woman and woman needs man, that they've been supernaturally designed to complement or complete one another, and that the world is a better place because women are in it. Can I get a hearty amen from all the men in the room? Amen, amen right? The world is a better place because women are in it. And godly men recognize their weaknesses and need for help. This isn't about some sort of inferiority, superiority complex between the sexes. God simply saw that man alone wasn't sufficient and made woman to complement or complete him, thereby bringing a fullness and goodness to the creation. How sweet is that? It was not good. He made woman. It is very good. Now, another observation is that the role of helper implies that the woman has strengths that are different and complementary to the man. There's a reason why God made a woman and not a second man. A woman was needed for her complementary design. Man and woman don't have to be the same. Right? There is a divine, divine design and beauty in their differences, in their strengths and in their giftings which is a bit ironic given our society likes to say that it's really great at diversity and then works incredibly hard to minimize all of the differences between men and women and say, nope, they're the same. Treat them as the same. It's an illogical approach to manhood and womanhood. And it greatly diminishes the beauty and the value of woman to make them just like a man or or vice versa, to make a man just like a woman. That's going against the creator's plan. No, I, there's a lot that we've already said, uh, maybe some controversial things as well. We have to keep moving, okay? We've got to keep, keep, keep going on. There's a lot to say about God's good design. What we see is that not only did he create woman in his image and likeness and give woman particular callings, God also didn't create woman to operate all by herself. We've already been seeing this. God created woman to rule side by side with man and to fill the earth and subdue it. Which then, uh, you know, leads us to conclude and embrace the truth that God did not make woman self-sufficient. God did not make woman self-sufficient. Again, despite what the feminists would have you think, woman is not a superior being to man, nor a carbon copy of man. They are a unique and beautifully different being than man. Equal yet distinct. Equal yet distinct. And man and woman need one another. Without one another, the human race disappears, right? ceases to exist. Without one another, the existence of the human race would, frankly, be a whole lot duller. Think about your, your kitchen for a moment. You go to your drawer and you pull out your, your utensil drawer and everything in it is a fork. Right? How in the world are you going to enjoy a good soup in the fall? How are you going to cut that nice, fresh loaf of bread? If everything's a fork, life's a whole lot duller. Or how about in the, in the tool shed or the workshop, wherever you, wherever you keep everything, all your tools? If you go out to your tool shed and everything in there is a hammer, how are you going to hang a sheet of drywall and, and paint it and have a beautiful house? How are you going to lay tile on the floor? And the answer is you, you can't and you won't. God has made us beautifully different and dependent on one another. Woman needs man just as much as man needs woman. And the world is better and more beautiful for it. Now, biblical womanhood does not allow for any sort of superiority complex, ladies. Um, It's not permissible to say, well, I'm a strong, independent woman who don't need no man. That's That's not biblical womanhood. You need others in your life. Just as the man uh, needed the woman, the woman needed the man, right? And so today, we need relationships and companionship. And in the context of how we as men and women relate to one another today, this passage becomes an important reminder to us of our interdependence and need for one another. As human beings, we're not made to go through life alone and to try to do things in our own strength. Now, this is not an argument that we all must be married. That's not what the scripture is arguing for here. It simply means that we are made for relationships. We're not made to be alone. And when it comes to marriage, 
Women need men, and men need women. Biblical womanhood embraces the beauty and the joy of being a helper in the task of filling and subduing the earth. You embrace it. You're thankful for it. So ladies, it's important for you this morning to recognize with humility your lack of self-sufficiency. You weren't created to do it on your own. If you puff yourself up and pretend like, I can take on the world and I don't need anyone else, you're going against your creator's design. And wise King Solomon put it this way in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. We've heard this before. He said, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift his fellow up. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. Solomon is telling us that there's strength and protection in relationship. That Whether this is between a man and a woman in a marriage or some other form of a relationship, because we have coworkers and friends and all those other forms of relationship, it's better to be doing life together than by ourselves. Right? We need one another. And there's no place for proud self-sufficiency in a godly woman. So ladies, you have to be willing to let others in. Whether you're a loner or an introvert, or maybe you're just busy with your career or family or the other demands of life, don't do it alone. That's not how God designed you. Life is so much richer when you allow others to walk with you and alongside of you in that journey. Again, Solomon says there's strength in numbers. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, I don't have time for that. My life is so busy, how in the world am I going to have relationships with other people? Well, if, if that's where you're at and you don't have time for relationships, maybe you need to rethink your other commitments. Perhaps you've made yourself busier than you should be. Or maybe you're thinking that you're busier than you really are, and you need to evaluate that. Maybe you're worked up over issues that should not prevent you from relationships. And I've seen this happen with new moms often. Life with, with baby, right, after, after having baby is hard, like no doubt about that, but that's no excuse to withdraw from your relationships. That's rather a time when you need people in your corner, people who can walk with you through all of the life changes that are coming your way so fast. You need wise counselors who can help you navigate parenting and even postpartum depression if that's something that you face after childbirth. You need help processing all of the changes that are coming to your life and to your family unit now that you've brought another little human being into it. Regardless of whether that's your life situation or it's something else, ladies, you need women who will speak into your life people who you've invited to speak freely into your life, to challenge you and to encourage you to grow as a woman of God. Do you have those kind of women in your life? And if the answer is no, what's keeping you from them? I would really encourage you to spend some time, uh, like today or later this week, wrestling with that. If there's a discernible lack of, of deep, committed relationships in your life with other women, especially women who will help you, encourage you, challenge you to grow in your walk with the Lord, why is that and what needs to change? And is there someone in particular that comes to your mind who you think, that would be a great person, I need to get to know her, I need to be intentional to spend time with her, I need to invite her in. I would encourage you to write that name down and to do that. Let's keep going. There's a lot to say. Unfortunately, where we've got to go next is the beauty of the creation ideals of Genesis 1 and 2 come crashing down a bit with the rebellion of woman in Genesis 3. Woman did not successfully submit to God's plan, but instead, woman turned against God's design. Woman turned against God's design. And we see this in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 12. And again, for the sake of time, I won't be reading that, but I would encourage you, if you haven't read it already over the last few weeks, write Genesis 3, 1 through 12 down and go back and review it. What we're going to do, like we did with the men, is we're going to talk through some of the elements of woman's rebellion that we see in this passage. And these elements are actually important for you to understand because they still show up in your struggle as a woman to this day. 
So in verses 1 through 7, we see that woman listened to the snake instead of God. Woman listened to the snake instead of God. So she's deceived by the snake, which is Satan, and she begins to doubt God's truthfulness. That became her undoing. Ladies, this is a key reminder for you that your first allegiance must always be to God. Godly women prioritize God's word. And they obey God first and foremost. And when the culture or other voices contradict what God says, a godly woman says, nope, I'm not going there. I'm, I'm going to side with, with my creator. I'm going to believe what he says. And there's a real war right now for you ladies in this area. The culture has a loud message that's trying to blare into your life. And you must be alert to it. Now, unfortunately, Genesis 3 reveals that man and woman go on to disobey God. That Eve was deceived and then invited Adam to participate in her rebellion. And now, as a result, they both know evil. And we've seen it, right? In our day and age, humanity still struggles with evil. We know evil. We're tempted by it. We desire it. It's a, it's a, it's a real problem. So not only did woman listen to the snake and, instead of God, she also hid from God. That's the second thing we see here. She hid from God. And that's in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 3. So when God comes walking through the garden, man and woman take off the other direction. We are told that they're ashamed of their nakedness. So instead of delighting in the creator, they're hiding in shame. And Eve, for her part, rather than helping her husband confess sin and obey God, helps him flee from God and get away and hide in rebellion. Ladies, are you helping others handle sin God's way or are you enabling sin? Right? You have incredible influence. Use it wisely. Now, unfortunately, the woman went even further in the wrong direction. Not only does she hide from God, she then blamed the serpent rather than taking ownership. When God questioned the woman on what she had done, in verse 13, her response was, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So rather than taking ownership for her disobedience, she's now pointing the finger at the serpent, again, who's Satan, and she blames him. And her response here demonstrates a lack of humility that, that should have led to confession and repentance. When I meet with couples to work through these kind of issues, conflict and marriage or a variety of other struggles, one of the things I always make sure to point out to them is, hey, you have to deal with, with your side of the, the issue. You can't, you can't change others. You can only change yourself. And what we see in Scripture is God never gives us an excuse to point our fingers at the other person and say, it's their fault. They're the reason that I did this. They're the reason that I sinned. They made me do it. That's not how it works. What we see in the pages of Scripture is that godly men and women take ownership for their part of the problem. So ladies, for you, you must take the log out of your own eye before you're ever able to take the speck out of someone else's eye. Whether that's in your marriage, conflict with your spouse, or perhaps in your family unit with conflict with a child, or maybe it's in the workplace, conflict with a coworker, or in your neighborhood, whatever it may be, a godly woman first turns the magnifying glass on herself and asks, are there any ways that I contributed to this problem? Are there any ways that I need to confess and ask forgiveness and change? That's the position of humility. And that's exactly what this first woman did not do. And the result of this was that her calling became harder. Right? Her calling became harder. If we look at Genesis 3, verse 16, here's what God says to the woman. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. If you're, if you're paying attention to the, the areas of the curse there that affects a woman, it's on childbearing and her role as a helper. Two key components to the woman living out her calling. And that curse has been woman's reality since Genesis chapter 3. God's design for women as a bearer of ch children is actually reinforced here. 
And what we've uh, already seen in our time together today is that this process of childbirth has already been so incredibly complicated and made painful by sin. Right? We've already talked some about the brokenness of that. But what we also see now is that sin corrupts the desires of the man and the woman when it comes to how they relate to each other. So rather than delighting to help, now the woman will desire to manipulate her husband, either by fighting to be in charge and to lead, or with pleasing passivity. And he will be tempted to respond by domineering. Sin tempts the woman to contest God's good design for the man to lead. And that desire to rule rather than to help, that then leads to all kinds of other perversions. One such example is women forsaking or disdaining their womanhood. Rather than valuing the way that God has made you, women believe there's a better way. Right? They buy into the lies of the culture that a woman should be like a man, just better. And there's nothing preventing a woman from using her time, talents, and treasures in the working world. There's nothing wrong with that. But there is some very real and serious consequences when she does that at the expense of her marriage or her home and her family. Right? It's very tempting for a woman to have dominion for her sake rather than God's glory. To build a career for selfish reasons rather than following the example of someone like the Proverbs 31 woman who had an industrious life, who worked hard, did all sorts of amazing things, but it was for her family's benefit. There is a key difference in the goal there of dominion. Is it your good and your glory or the glory of God and the good of others? That's a real perversion of the, of the topic of womanhood that you must be on the lookout for as women. It's subtle yet profound. Beware the temptation to worship self by building your own kingdom rather than worshiping the Lord by serving his kingdom. You really need to ask yourself, ladies, what is the end goal of your dominion? Are you dominating that job for the glory of God or for your glory? Are you dominating that job for the benefit of your namesake or for the good of your family? Do you bristle at the idea of cultivating a marriage or a home or a family? Does that sound inferior to you? rather than cultivating a career? And if you'd answer yes to that, you've been deceived by the lies of our culture, by the lies of feminism. God has created you with incredible character and know-how and abilities, but he's also given you direction for how you use them. Make sure you're allowing God's good design to inform the ways that you think about these matters. Titus 2 has some clear instructions for both men and women on how to conduct themselves in this life. And frankly, you might be surprised at how clearly God emphasizes the home as the primary domain for a woman to exercise dominion and cultivate a beautiful harvest of righteousness. There's a book that I have posted about multiple times on social media this week. I want to recommend it to you this morning. It's called Eve in Exile by Rebecca Merkel. It's an excellent book. I read it in a day and a half. Um, just couldn't put it down, frankly. I would highly recommend it in either written format or there's a documentary form uh, through a Canon Press, the, the company that produced it. But obviously she's a lady. She's, she's writing it as a female, uh, a woman who understands both the push of our culture and the beauty of God's good design for, for women. And she's able to articulate this in a beauty, beautiful, beautiful way. Just the beauty of God's good design um, and how, how powerful it is. She's able to speak into the influences from our culture that are coming against you every day, tempting you to disdain the way God has made women. And she speaks right towards it. I cannot recommend this resource enough. By the time I was done reading it yesterday, I was in tears. And I shared a little bit about this on Facebook, but tears of conviction for my lack of faith that God could rebuild our broken nation and tears of hope and joy at what could be if women in our nation had an accurate understanding and application of their design and calling from God. I finished this book realizing women are incredibly powerful and when in unison that power can be incredibly destructive as we've seen play out in our culture 
or incredibly life-giving as God designed it. Women have a powerful influence when they use their time, talent, and treasure in the realms to which God has called them. Their incredible creative power and beauty is capable of producing wonderful fruit in the workplace, in their marriages, in their home, and in their families. But none of this will happen apart from God at work in you and you willfully following his design. Or this is not something that you can do in your own strength or by following the world's sinful direction that it's saying, hey, follow me, go this way. This is how you should live as a woman. Now, I have a lot more that I'd like to say, um, but for the sake of time, we'll leave it for next week. There's a whole other sermon where we're going to go into more detail about a woman and her role and relationship with her creator and with others around her. But before we close the books today, there's one last truth about God's good design for women that we have to embrace. And this one is found in Genesis 3.15, where God is now speaking to Satan, to the serpent. And here's what God says to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. But this passage is what's known as the Proto-Evangelium. It means the first gospel. It's the indicator that God has a plan that he will send one to defeat the power of sin and death. Which leads us to our last truth for this morning to embrace. That God provides his son as the redeemer of woman. God provides his son as the redeemer of woman. And we know from the pages of the New Testament that this this one that God would send is his own son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise all the way back in Genesis 3.15. Jesus, born of a woman, came to redeem women. And I love uh, the example that we see in the Gospel of John chapter 4, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, if you're familiar with that story. Jesus is you know, traveling with his disciples and uh, he takes a break at a well and his disciples go into town to get supplies and there's a Samaritan woman there and Jesus begins to interact with her and, and that was frankly unheard of in those days. He was a Jewish man interacting with a Samaritan woman. The Jews and the Samaritans hated one another and, and for the genders to interact like that was shocking. It was rare, especially in a positive way and so even the woman's like, why are you talking to me? And ultimately Jesus' goal was not just to get a drink of water from her but rather to begin to tell her that he was the living water who had come for her. And he went on to reveal personal details about her life in order to convict her of her sin and to convince her that he was the Messiah who had come for her. He was pointing out her need to repent and believe in him, for he is the redeemer of women. Over the last three weeks, we've talked about this, this next passage quite a bit, and I, I want to bring it up again today. It's Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. <laughs> that's an all-encompassing passage. We talked about how that's true for the men. Ladies, it's true for you too. Women are sinners. And just like men, you need the redemption of Christ. And here's the hope that Jesus provides for you as women and for us as men. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, Paul tells us, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That call to confess and believe is for you, ladies. It's for every single one of us. Has there been a time in your life where you've acknowledged your need for a Savior? that you've bowed the knee and confessed your need for Jesus Christ to rescue and redeem you? And if the answer is no, what's stopping you from doing that today? And if you have questions about that, certainly I would love to chat with you after the service. Feel free to send the church an email. Don't let, that, don't let those questions go unanswered. They have eternal significance for you. Now, the beauty of, of the Bible is that it also gives us many more snippets of, of Jesus' interaction with women. In Luke 8, verses 1 through 3, we see uh, Jesus calling women to follow him. And we hear that they were instrumental in supporting his ministry. So now Jesus is not only redeeming women, he's partnering with them to accomplish the mission. And just a couple chapters later in Luke 10, uh, Jesus visits Martha and Mary in their home. 
Martha invites Jesus in. She's showing him hospitality so that he has a place to teach. And while there, Jesus personally counsels Martha through this conflict that she has with Mary. And she, he encourages Mary to, to sit and be present in his teaching. Right? So Jesus doesn't treat women as if they're lesser, but he gives them his time and attention. And then after his death and resurrection, Jesus first appeared to women. We find that in Luke 24. And the, the beauty of this is there's some real significance in the primacy of the witnesses of the resurrection being women. It's a statement about the value of women to Jesus and ultimately to Christianity. Because in those days, in that culture, women did not have a valid testimony in, in their court system. They, they weren't going to be called as witnesses. They're, they wouldn't have been trusted. Jesus doesn't care about that. He values women and he's their redeemer. So he personally appears to them in his resurrection to show him his resurrection power. And as you would expect, the result of Jesus' redemption of women is that he then calls them into service as disciple makers for Christ. Ladies, the great commission is for women. The call to be ambassadors for Christ is for women. So please do not diminish the beauty of God's good design for you. Do not buy into the lies of our culture about what a woman is or what a woman is not. Right? They're confused anyways. They don't even know. that I can't give you a consistent answer. But God's word is true and unchanging. And he has a glorious design for women. So I want to encourage you to embrace the truth of God's good design. Let's pray.